People often ask me, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I run a toy company, and I invent toys, and I design all kinds of bouncing putties. And in the back of my mind, I'm kind of doubting my own words. Do kids actually need someone to design their toys? My kids can play for hours with cardboard boxes and bubble wrap. And one day, my daughter spent an entire afternoon repeatedly immersing her head in a pot of water, bobbing for orange slices and blowing air bubbles. So I think to be a toy designer is a pretty tall order. You've got to be good. And because kids' brains are wired differently than ours, sometimes what we think is an awesome idea actually turns out to be really boring for them. So with my designs, I try to elicit that wow, that aha moment in both adults and children to inspire their curiosity, connect the unconnected, and offer unanticipated results, hopefully keeping things open-ended enough so that the user of the product comes up with ideas and inventions, things I couldn't have even imagined. And so I've created putties like Magnetic Putty that crawls over to the magnet as if it was alive and then envelops it like the blob. Others that are one color in the daytime and then, surprise, a totally different color in the dark. Even putties that are so crystal clear that when you open the package, it's as if nothing is even in it. It appears empty. Now, to create these different, these different products, it's more than just imagine it, make it, ship it, like in a 30-second commercial. It's incredibly complicated. First, there's years of chemistry, which I never studied, trying to figure out how to make your vision turn into a product that can exist in the physical world. And then, how do you make a, a factory, a manufacturing facility that can actually produce this material? Designing and specking all of the machines and flowing the process and all of the materials from one place to another, packaging it, warehousing it, shipping it. The details of building a company, the accounting, the bookkeeping, the staffing. It's very complicated. There's lots of problems. There's problems every day. And in the past 16 years that I've been doing this, I've come up with some, some helpful brainstorming tricks and problem-solving strategies that have been useful to me, and I'd like to share some of them with you now. First, start with the impossible. When you have that, that flash, that, that idea, that inspiration, don't stop there. Think bigger. Try to imagine for a moment the most awesome incarnation of that idea that you can imagine. Stop thinking like a problem solver. Start thinking like a science fiction author. Think big. And now that you have this fantasy, you can pare it back step by step based on what might actually be possible. And with luck, you'll end up with something that is definitely more work than your original idea. But it'll be inspired, creative, revolutionary, and worth the effort. Maybe this is why some of our most innovative inventors come from outside the field of their invention. Because they haven't learned, they haven't been told the things not to try. And so they're willing to try and try and fail. And 99.999% of the time, they do fail. It isn't easy. And the laws of physics don't bend. But the fact is, is that if they try enough, eventually they realize that one of those rules is actually besides the point. Edwin Land is a name that is probably less familiar to an audience today than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. His crowning achievement, the Polaroid Corporation, has spent the past 20 years drifting in and out of bankruptcy. And his most famous invention, instant photography, has been eclipsed by the digital imaging revolution. But Land was actually one of the most prolific inventors of the 20th century. And his first big invention has become so ubiquitous, so invisible in our daily lives, that we can hardly imagine a time when such a thing didn't exist. That is, he invented a polarizing film. So imagine as light is traveling, it's a wave. And that wave has an axis, in this case, perpendicular to the ground. It could be parallel. It could be somewhere in between. And all the things, all the technology we have, cell phones and flat screens and sunglasses and 3D movies, and what makes all of these work is the ability to have a cheap, mass-producible film that can only pass light in a very particular axis. This is a problem that was intractable back in the 1920s. Scientists and engineers, they all knew if such a material existed, the applications would be endless. The problem was, 
To get a polarizing filter, you needed to slowly grow large crystals in the laboratory in one of those science fiction bubblers, and then carefully slice it to get what you needed. It took forever. It was expensive, and the result was delicate. So major research institutions had efforts to find a way to grow the crystals faster, or maybe we can find a way to cut them thinner. Maybe we can, we can cut them and make them less, uh, less likely to break. Land was 20 years old. He was completely unaffiliated with any corporate or research institution. He had dropped out of Harvard after his freshman year, and he was living in New York on a time-limited stipend from his parents to find himself. And he was obsessed, obsessively curious about this idea that this material could exist. And he spent most of his days at the New York Public Library studying, reading well, what was known about polarizing materials, and at night, he would return to his basement apartment and try what makeshift experiments he could. And he hit on this idea because he couldn't replicate the labs at GE or another major corporation. What he was going to try was instead of thinking big, he was going to think small. Instead of growing a large crystal, he would take millions of microscopic crystals, embed them in a plastic film, and then somehow, he didn't know how, coax them all to line up in exactly the same direction as the plastic set and in doing so, create effectively a single large crystal. So without laboratory equipment, he decided he would climb the fire escape at night and break into a lab at Columbia University, <laughs> night after night, this is true, and perform his experiments, carefully timing chemical reactions to make sure that they would be finished and he could clean up before the maintenance staff arrived at dawn. And after months and months of work, and listening to naysayers and ignoring all of their advice, he did it. He aimed for the impossible, and he hit the mark. Next, I like to reach beyond what I know, now that I have my impossible idea. Reaching beyond what you know means going, not looking to solve the problem at hand, but going in a completely unrelated direction. Instead of studying chemistry to solve a putty problem, go to the art museum and just wander around or go online and read about some, some hobby that you actually have no interest in, something completely beyond anything you know. I like to go to trade shows. I like to immerse myself. And so I go on the website of the Pennsylvania Convention Center and see what's coming to town in the next few weeks. It helps if you have a business card that's related to what the show is about to get yourself in the door, but don't let that stop you. You can go online and print business cards now. You can, you can get yourself in the door. And once you're there, you'll be like me, standing on the floor of a 250,000 square foot convention center for a medical equipment show <laughs> with hundreds of booths staffed with thousands of people whose only job there is to just stand there and answer your questions. And so I wander around. I wander around, and every time I see something shiny ooh, or pretty, ah, I stop and I say, what is this? What does it do? How is it made? Why this way and not that? And the answers that are coming to me, com to be completely honest, are way over my head. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. I find a booth where there's these tiny metal tubes, incredibly small, that are somehow implanted in the human body, and they have a microscope to show how the insides are completely polished. And I'm fascinated. How do you make something? I can barely even see the tube, let alone imagine someone going in there and, and polishing it. And while the person is explaining to me and the information is coming this way, completely unrelated ideas are coming into my head from a different direction. And so a few hours later, I leave the show, and I have my, my tote bag, and in my tote bag are some brochures that I'll never look at again, <laughs> some photos on my iPhone of some really cool-looking stuff to show my friends that none of us will even remember what it is. But also, I leave with the solution to a manufacturing problem that had been vexing me for months and was completely unrelated to anything that anyone said to me at the show and completely unrelated to anything having to do with medical devices. Next, I like to look to the past. The US Patent Archive, in particular, is a veritable treasure trove of curious people solving all sorts of problems for the past 225 years. The patent system was established right at the beginning 
of the United States. And it was different than the kind of monopolies that kings would often grant to aristocrats or inventors for their, in perpetuity or for their entire lives. It was enshrined right into the Constitution to promote science and the useful arts by offering to inventors for a limited time the exclusive right to exploit their ideas and inventions. And so there's a bit of a social contract there. You, the inventor, agree to write down your invention, how it works, the details, all of the important stuff. What came before it? Why was it inferior? Why is yours better? And in exchange for that bit of scholarship, which goes directly into the public domain, the government gives you the exclusive right to exploit that idea or invention for 20 years. And so there's a gold mine of ideas there, over 8 million of them, over half of which have terms that have expired, and everything contained within them is completely free to use. So if you think that a problem that you have can't be helped in this way, you're not thinking broadly enough. You're not thinking broadly enough. Anything can happen that has happened before will happen now. We're the same people. We have arms and legs, and we like to spend time with our friends and family. We, we love our children. We like to communicate with each other. So go online, search for something, and see what you can find. You'd be surprised at finding a solution to a current problem, but it only uses technology that existed in, say, 1950. Often, Patents are never commercialized. They never see the light of day for a variety of reasons. Maybe they would have been too expensive or it was patented, but it wasn't really in the corporate interest at that time to move it forward. Or maybe it lacked a technology which has since been invented, but it was long forgotten, say computers or plastics. Maybe it needed an infrastructure behind it that now exists, say the interstate highway system or the cell phone network. A friend of mine, Bob Crowley, of Soundwave Research Labs, he's used this very technique in his own inventions. And one of them is very relevant to this very moment in time. Because I'm standing here wearing a wireless microphone, like speakers did all day long and do at every event like this, and in houses of worship, and on Broadway, and shows and events. And unfortunately, they're very prone to dropout and interference. And it's a problem because I'm standing here and I'm moving and I'm turning and bending and the radio waves are bouncing all around this room creating reflections on various surfaces at different angles. It's really hard for those anten antennas over there to predict what's going to happen next. Well, Bob thought if he could solve this problem, it would be a pretty good opportunity. And he decided to get to work, but he didn't, he didn't do it by researching the current state of the industry, and what are the other competitors doing, and what are their most advanced products, because he's not that kind of guy. Instead, he went all the way back to the beginning, and he pulled the papers of Heinrich Hertz. That's Heinrich Hertz of megahertz and gigahertz, the man who proved that these imaginary waves that had been predicted by Maxwell's mathematical equations were actually a real thing that existed in the world. And people said to him, Bob, you're wasting your time. What are you doing? This is a problem that has been poured over by some of the greatest minds for years. And no one's come up with a solution. You think going back to the beginning, you're going to see something in Hertz's papers. They're 130 years old. If there was something in there, it would have been found already. His, his language is, is out of date. He doesn't even understand half of the concepts we know now. But none of that mattered to him. Because it wasn't about searching the text and looking for the answer written out exactly for him. It was about reading about radio in a way that was archaic, almost difficult to understand before any terminology had really properly been defined. And in doing that, he had his flash of inspiration, and he developed what's called the diversity fin antenna. And it's an antenna that completely solves the problem of dropout and distortion with a wireless microphone and allows all of us to enjoy events like this so much more. Lastly, I like to study how things fail. Biologists do this all the time. They take an organism and now we have the power to knock out a single gene. And then we let the organism develop and we see how is it different? What's changed? How did that minor tweak in the recipe affect the cake at the end? I like to do it with mechanical devices. So I'll 
take some moving parts of a machine and just get a screwdriver at it. Start taking screws out one by one until you see it fail. Put it back together. Try again. It's very helpful because you can see which components of something that's kind of unfamiliar and mysterious are actually necessary versus others that are just a veneer. Back in college, I had a friend who had worked in building construction with his father. And I was always amazed at his ability to just whip out a little notepad and take some scribbles and some measurements and run to the hardware store. He could build anything. He built our furniture. He built his own home. He can do it. And I would always ask him, because I'm the kind of guy that's curious about things, how to, how to make things. I would say, how do you do it? And he would try to explain it to me, and it would go zoom right over my head. And I knew the problem was me, because millions of people practice building construction every day. So clearly, they get it, and I don't. And then years later, I found myself, I had decided to become a volunteer firefighter. And there was a lot of training, and they sent me off to training school, and I found myself in a class called Building Construction. And it made me a little nervous, because I knew this was something that I had struggled with previously. Uh, but then I realized this class isn't about how to build buildings. It's about how fire destroys them and all the bad things that happen as a building starts to come apart. And they taught me the things I needed to do to stay safe, to stay alive, things to look out for. And maybe that, that door isn't the quickest exit, but with my ax, that wall there that probably has minimal ductwork is my fastest route of escape. And like that, it hit me. I understood building construction. I understood the components to a building that were important and necessary, the pieces that were structural and the way that loads were transferred and how it all worked and why, and how my friend, with just a few scribbles and some measurements, could build pretty much anything. So those four techniques, start with your impossible idea, reach outside what you know, looking to the past for answers, and studying how things fail. I hope those ideas, they give you some gear turning upstairs so that you can inspire your own curiosity. The world has a lot of problems, and together we can get out there and solve them. Thank you very much.